Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 37. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Dave, we're on episode 37. I just got back from Chicago at KubeCon. You were in Florida, Miami for a Cisco event and a big IBM analyst events going on. Um, incredible week of AI action. It's, again, generative AI all the time, every day, <laughs> every company uh, is here. The, this is, the, I mean, to me, the topic dominating um, the conversation continues to be generative AI and the impact. People are afraid of it. It's changing the paradigm shifts of all businesses. Uh, and this week, um, there was a couple seminal moments going on this week that are worth kind of highlighting. Um, I mean, besides the economy and some of the things we'll get to in, in, in more of the analysis section, is that you had two things that happened here uh, this week that I think really point to um, the radical shift of AI that we've been talking about on the Cube Pod for a long time. One is Open AI had their dev day on 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 this week, this Monday. Uh, it's pretty incredible. And um, yesterday, um, the AI pin was launched, which was a moonshot project that is essentially a very Apple-esque product. And it, it was um, developed by former Apple iPhone um, creatives and engineers, creating essentially a device, a wearable device, that is, remind me of the Google Glass conversations, a wearable device that's a phone powered by T-Mobile. And it's a, it's a really elegant device that takes pictures, um, picks up sounds. It's almost like a body camera, a personal assistant. You can get gesture, augmented gesturing, just incredible. Um, and it's made by a company called Humane AI. It's a case study for a wearable future. And Amazing how fast this came out. It's it, it, really... It's revolutionary. It? Well, a lot of people are like, well, Steve Jobs would be rolling. He never would approve that script. Uh, but it was the both the open AI and the um, the, uh, the uh, pin was a significant thing because you had two modern launches. One was a keynote, uh, and you pointed out that strategy article from Ben Thompson, which I thought was right on. It was very Apple-esque. I was actually commenting that on the Cube. Uh, at KubeCon was people were cheering. It felt like it was only their first event for OpenAI and people were cheering. This is a cult-like status. OpenAI has so much momentum um, and and they're doing a great job. And I was very impressed, inspired by Sam Altman and the team. It was a tight, it was a tight keynote packed with great messaging. They maximized their time. And then the AI pin that was launched yesterday was perfectly orchestrated, like a, a great video. Um, it was just elegant device pimping up the fact that it's beautiful the next apple kind of vibe um and people were were really kind of hammering it like and i thought that was not fair because to me it was witnessing like a moonshot a moonshot you know what a moonshot is moonshot is a term that they say for the big audacious ideas that have big goals you want to go for something in the moon and it's, it's a big idea and they spent a lot of time building this device both from an operating system standpoint the connectivity the capabilities uh, it's elegant looking. It's not an eyesore um, device like the Google Glass was. It's more comp complicated. It's a moonshot device. Will it fail? Maybe, but it was damn cool, I thought. Now, the privacy people are freaking out because it's like, dude, we're talking about cameras on your body. It's like body cams. And we, you know, we were joking years ago. Remember, we said people are going to have body cams and, and streaming their own lives and then, you know, bring into the cube. And we had this vision of like, hey, you know, everyone could walk around reinvent and we'll just, you know, run a kinesis a pipeline into the cloud and stream it to the cube. Well, guess what? That shit might happen, you know? <laughs> so, so this is like, a very big moonshot. Um, and then obviously KubeCon, huge implications there. Again, an infrastructure show, generative AI was front and center. Um, ethical concerns around privacy, security, um, end to end. Uh, and then just a lot of news. You have some good news and some bad news. You saw a lot of um, still getting funding rounds are down significantly. Um, and again, on the business side, every single company is looking for their AI tailor, right? Their AI clothing manufacturer. Everyone wants to change their clothes and put on their AI wares. We are AI. IBM IBM was a classic example. I'm watching Rob, um, Rob Thomas up there. It's almost like they're putting the clothes back on again and, and like putting on the new fashion. Every single company is going through oh. the following motions. Update your talk, off. update your talk track. Do this. I mean, you were there. I mean, from the far, it looked it, it looked I, weak. 
but that's oh, my it was it was it was ibm well was it it wasn't public right was it there was tons of stuff going on in public i saw a bunch of people yeah there's um, stuff on social yeah it was far from weak it was actually really impressive um that's funny why do you say that it looked weak what did you see that, that it, it suggested just, it, it was weak and the slides were like unbelievably detailed of course, you, they people it's couldn't like, share the NBA it just, slides. It, it felt it felt like well, it felt like everyone. That, I'm skeptical now of the AI because it's like everyone's trying to say, "Look, we had AI before it was AI." Okay, and I know Rob Thomas because we quoted him in a very positive way on the Cube, saying he had IA before AI, information architecture. And you know, Rob Thomas is a great guy. We love Rob. So it's not, not 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 getting on him. Just saying is that it just feels like IBM and, and how they're talking about it. It feels like they're just late to the party and they're trying too hard to be cool. Um, well, I would, I, and, I would say, and, and, and you know, I don't like the Watson name. I think that's 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 no. Uh, so this is the this was the topic of my breaking analysis today because I mean I've kind of been a skeptic here, but then when we did that show with um, the guys in the IBM storage group, the the data the storage summit that we had out in Palo Alto, yeah. I interviewed uh, Vincent Shu who is like a, an alpha geek in IBM. Uh -huh. And uh, and he was telling me, because I, I didn't go to Think this year, <clears throat> where they announced Watson X, so I, I kind of didn't pay attention to it. I'm like, okay, it's like same wine, new bottle. And But then when I talked to Vincent this summer, I was like, holy shit, are you shipping this? He goes, yes, we announced in May. And then they've announced all these other modules, AI, and then now they now they got they got governance coming in 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 December, and they've got this really robust roadmap. They I think IBM finally got it right with Watson. I mean Watson, one was just a fail. You know my <laughs> what I say in my breaking analysis today is you know the Silicon Valley mantra fail fast. Well Watson one didn't. It took like a decade to to fail, but it failed huge. I, but but Watson 2.0 is is actually the balls. I mean, it's really, really good. They have a robust uh, stack from silicon all the way through the analytics up to the 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 ISVs and the stack, their own SaaS. And they they've got AI chips, they've got partnerships. Obviously, Hugging Face is a big partner. Um mm -hmm. I would tell you, I was really impressed, and here's why. So I have been so critical of IBM's inability in the 2010s to actually turn R&D into product. IBM's got all these like gorgeous research facilities. Like we were just at the Thomas J. Watson research facility in Yorktown Heights. And I had been there like years and years ago when I was at IDC, back when IBM was, you know, king. Mm -hmm. And I've been to the Almaden. I've been to a number of IBM research facilities. You've been, right? They're they're unbelievably gorgeous. We were we covered we covered right. IBM's AI before anybody else. I mean, everyone so, else in the market was like behind on the curve. Yeah, but I know, but so but they were trying to make Watson. It's like we talked to Jeff Jonas about this. They were trying to make Watson do things that it wasn't intended to do, like you know, solve cancer and you know, climb trees. And so, but so what was really interesting was the cultural change that I see in IBM from the standpoint of getting going from research to product and commercializing it and dropping it to the bottom line income statement. And I asked IBM, I asked Dario Gill, like, you know, like what's changed? I want some specifics on this. And his answer was so good. He's like, look, we used to, IBM research, they used to run around. This was really interesting. They used to say each research, whether it was, you know, Almaden or Yorktown Heights or, or Japan, you have to be known for something. What are you going to be known for? Ooh, ooh, I'll take database. Ooh, I'll take supercomputing or, you know, whatever it is. And they had all these bespoke projects going on. So we've done away with that. And now it's like they have the resources are pooled and the product, the engineering teams are much closer to the research. And so they've really shifted the culture. And then the other thing, and there were like six or seven other really key dimensions that I won't go into in the interest of time. But then Rob Thomas said something that was really interesting. He said, I want to say it was like three months ago. He said, if you're in product, your job is product. And it used to be, if you're in product, you did like, you know, one third product like management, one third 
product marketing, one third go to market. And he said, no more. If you're in product, you're 100% in product. So much more focused. We don't need you in go to market. And, and he, he kind of hinted that that sort of pissed some people off, but he's like, I don't give a shit. He didn't, this is my words, not his. You don't like it, leave. We're going to focus. Product management is product management. Product marketing is product marketing. Go to market is go to market. So focus. And I just, it, the, the cultural shift to me was palpable. And then when you combine it with what they're actually delivering, and the last thing I'll say is if you look at the data in the spending data, the ETR data, IBM in April um, of 2023, the month before they announced Watson X, was was like below the line. I mean, it looked kind of like pretty shitty. And in the October survey, it shot up and surpassed Oracle. So the point is, it seems like when somebody announces something that's substantive, they get spending momentum. We saw it with obviously ChatGPT and well, Microsoft and OpenAI. We definitely saw it with Google when they announced in May Vertex AI. We're seeing it with IBM. And I think we're going to see it big time with Bedrock that just went GA. Um, and so I was impressed, John, I have to say. Well, I'm glad that was good, good uh, overview on IBM. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, um, I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I'm a little bit skeptical more on that. We'll see how they do. But generally, IBM, like every other company out there, has to come out. Uh, and this is a feature, not a bug. They have to come out and essentially reboot their image. Okay. Glad. To, I mean, IBM's got huge momentum in the marketplace, so I'm not surprised to see some of the, some of the, some of the increase of acceleration. The question is, can they sustain it? Uh, every company has to come out and say we're a generative AI company. After the Open AI Dev Day, it's clear that the developers are on board from the cheering and all the reactions from that from the content, and they ship product. People are using it. I was playing with it, and then look at KubeCon. We just came back from Chicago. I was there for uh, four days, and uh, this is the open source conference for cloud native, the cloud open source community, which is all embracing um, generative AI. And we had multiple analytic sessions on that. And it's clear that you can throw all the messaging you want and all the grandstanding and all the people cheering for the companies like IBM and others who are going to say, look at us, look at us. At the end of the day, the open source is a big part of the innovation. If you look at the power law of research that we put out, that Cube Research Team, formerly Wikibon, put out, you see the power law is getting massive traction at our, our work there. And, and why is it getting traction? Is because the open AI dev day points specifically to why traditional incumbents are, are struggling. Okay. IBM struggling, Amazon struggling. Um Cisco might be struggling. Maybe they're going to have something to come out because they have to essentially, as leaders, adopt it as fast as possible, slow it down or speed up. They got to either slow down the, the, the potential new entrants so that they can catch up. And, and as we pointed out, the people who have from the bigger companies who implement AI get better fast. So AI will favor the big companies. So I'm expecting AWS to tool up huge. I'm expecting IBM to tool up really huge. Cisco to tool up huge with AI because they have to, if they don't, they'll be behind. And they know that. So it's not like surprise. Every single other company, even in open source, Dave, are, br are bringing AI to the table. Okay. Experimentation and in production. Um, and in and, and, and the open source world, huge conversation around keeping it open, not closing it down. Okay. And, the, um, there's the, and then debate shift to, um, can the big models like, open AI, which is actually is ironically being called a proprietary model, even though it's open by the name and they crawl the web. Um, they're offering um, Turbo, GPT-4 Turbo, and it has, you know, your own your own GPT. So it's it's going to get traction. I mean, Inference is the new web app was Tim Hawkins' line at the keynote yesterday, uh, closing day keynote. Tim Hawkins was one of the inventors of Kubernetes, um, Cube alumni. I thought that was compelling. And Dustin Kirkland and I were talking about that, Dave. He said the new web app is inference, meaning GPT is going to be the new web app. You're going to see more GPT, custom GPT, than Substacks or YouTube videos. And people are going to start automating their workflows, a little bit of RPM meets AI kind of thing there, Dave. So generative AI is going to get massive traction in open source. So I thought the open AI um, uh, announcements were no noteworthy. 
They were shipping products. They increased their context window, which is huge for things for for in, ingesting articles. Uh, just to put it in perspective, 128 uh, um, bit um, context window is like a 300 page book. That's huge. Okay, that means all of our transcripts now from these videos can be sucked into into GPT Turbo, uh, and that's going to be that's going to be uh, a, a dream. The the re, the retrieval side of it, I think, is going to be interesting. The vector databases are providing great value for companies, and I think that's going to continue to be a feature, not a company, but it's going to be part of data stores. So I, I think that's going to coexist. So OpenAI was a huge win. Um, the you open know, the pebble, the pebble. I call it pebble. I call it pebble. The 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 pin AI pin. But that's the sideshow. Before um, you get off open AI, what what impressed me um, was the integrations that they're doing. Because you remember, you know, early on it was like, okay, we can go out to Expedia, we can go to American Airlines, we can book a hotel, you know, whatever it is. But those were really clunky integrations, and I don't think they're shipping this yet. But what they showed was like this seamless integration where the developer doesn't have to invoke anything. It's just services that are there that are invoked by natural language. That is going to be, I mean, I'm amazed at the pace at which they're moving. You know what I'm talking about with that integrations? Yeah. The partner integrations from OpenAI. Yeah, but specifically, like the the I mean, the example I'm using is travel. Book me, book me a a, a, a you know a, a trip to Milan, mm -hmm. and I want to stay at this type of hotel, and this is what yeah. I want to pay. And mm -hmm. before you really, it was really clunky to be able to do that. The developer would have to actually invoke the service. I mean, you have to actually do stuff like clicks. Whereas yeah. now it's just going to happen through natural language. And that yeah. is yeah, yeah, I think unbelievably well, powerful. Well, and I think I think the the neural network aspect of of AI is going to be a big part of the infrastructure. And again, I think we said it a few pods ago that we were pontificating like a new AI system is going to come out. I think the open AI is going to leverage their investment in the large language model and all the results from that training and make it an inference engine and let people bring their data sets in. That's what they announced with their their private uh, partner initiative. Um, and by the way, they're only going to be doing that as a professional service for only a handful of people. But the idea of having that figured out is going to be a huge win. Private LLMs is going to be a big deal. And that came up in um, at KubeCon. Oracle has a partner called Cohere. Cube alumni have been on there. Founders are there. They're working with OCI to do private LLMs. This is a huge feature. And that's Oracle the first and Microsoft. Thing. Um, Oracle and Microsoft part expanding their partnership. Did yeah. you see that? Yeah, exactly. That was so pretty amazing. And so, so I mean, but that's imagine... super cloud. Those guys are building a super cloud, despite what Insic Ray said. Poo poo. Well, you you lost me at Oracle. Remember, he said that at Super Cloud One. You lost I, me at Oracle. I, I, I Oracle's that... at an all time high. Insic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you busted my balls. You know, it's all about stock price, Dave. You know, and you can engineer you can engineer a stock price in many different ways. So yeah, well, you know, one way is or, to print or, or, cash, or, John. Or, yeah, Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say one other thing before we get off of, of I, I want I, I want to correct myself because uh, on a breaking analysis and maybe on the Q pod, I said that other than NVIDIA, Microsoft is the only company that is, you know, laying its Gen AI chops on the table. They said they had 300 basis point tailwind, incremental tailwind from Gen AI for Azure, which equates to probably 350, 400 million. I said those are the only two, NVIDIA and 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 Microsoft Open AI. It's not true. Arvind Krishna, I I I, I missed it. Uh, and I went back and and checked this morning. He said we did low hundreds of millions. And of course, one of the analysts, rightly so, was my first question. Yeah, how much of that was consulting and services? And he was honest. He said about half was consulting and the other half was software. So you're talking about north of 100 million in revenue from IBM. And, and I think Amazon, my assumptions are in cloud that Amazon is going to show um, – uh, uh, an uplift in growth this quarter. They had a little uplift last quarter, as you know, as I track mm -hmm. this stuff. I think it's going to be a couple of hundred basis points at least from Gen AI this this quarter now that Bedrock is GA. And I think after reInvent going into 2024, it's going to be even a bigger boost. And and it's all about acceleration and feature delivery. And, you know, uh, Charles Fitzy, his latest says, you know, he's telling Microsoft or uh, 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 AWS to give up. No way. They're building like 
mega LLMs and they're not going to give up. They're going to, they're going to dominate in my opinion. Well, I'm going to go see Adam Selesky next Friday. So a week from today, I'll be in Seattle sitting down for exclusive uh, interview with the CEO of AWS. And I'm going to ask him about this stuff. And I think, you know, they're getting hammered through a leaked um, uh, story around them building Olympus, which is their huge language model. You know, by the way, Fitzy's taking pot shots because he's Microsoft. And he's just Why are they getting to- hammered? That's like, isn't it like two trillion well, I mean, people. I mean, well, for, first of all, a lot of the a lot of the commentary coming from Charles Fitzgerald, mainly because he's Microsoft dogmatically a Microsoft guy, and he's got an axly <laughs> running with Amazon. So he's awesome. He's uh, he's he's he's. But his his real, I think, real contribution is his capex report, which was quoted in Financial Times. But I thought that was solid. Big story there. Amazon's not going away. Again, this is going to be a long game. Um, he it's it's an easy target. <laughs> he's. I mean, it's not hard to attack Amazon right now. Um, with some of the moves they're making, because you know it looks like they're groping, and we'll see what comes out of reinvent. And you know, you pointed out, Dave, this week on I think it was on uh, a tweet, or we were texting back and forth. We were on our our, our, our chat group. Um, Jassy's involved now, right? So, and we predicted that on the Cube Pod, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Would get he involved. runs AI. It reports um, to him. He's yeah. not screwed J- around. Remember, remember, Andy Jassy and Adam Selesky are were a very strong team as a management team. Most people don't know this. A lot of the other analysts that are kind of new on the scene, we see them out there who haven't been around for a very long time. They're kind of new and they're kind of the shallow hot takes out there running around saying, hey, look at, we know what you're talking about. Um, they haven't been around. Like they haven't even been around to even kind of get the power dynamics. But And then they're, and they're crapping on Amazon. Um Jassy and Selesky worked together even before he went to Tableau to get some CEO chops, um, which he then boomeranged back. That's what they call it when they come back. And that's why Jassy embraced him. And by the way, Jassy pretty much will embrace anyone that comes back. He told me that personally. Um, he's not against that at all, unless it's they burn the bridge. But Jassy is like, if, if I had to put Adam and Jassy, they're two different. It's like two people on the same sports team. One is got certain skill player and the other one could be the quarterback one's a receiver one's a running so they're definitely complementary but they're different skill sets uh, andy goes deep on product stuff loves to talk about product and he gets studies hard he's really in the books adam is very much on the more of a holistic big thinker around uh, strategy sales and marketing more more heavily on that side so we look at their strengths and weaknesses i see them teaming up um, on this. Uh, well, I'm going to try to confirm that more when I sit down with him with, with Adam. Um, but they're definitely working together. And, you know, Adam's not a lightweight either. He knows product. He knows what's going on. The question is, can they pull a rabbit out of the hat for reinvent? Right, Dave? So, you know, we're calling it the battle for cloud supremacy on our live stream. We're going to run that week. We're doing a special program called Super Cloud 5 Battle for um, AI Supremacy, which is really is. I mean, Microsoft's going to have their Ignite conference next week, Dave. That's going to be massive. You don't think they're going to come into that conference, guns blaring, post open AI? Because remember, Satya Nantella came on stage, okay? He flew down to uh, uh, Silicon Valley for this event. Why wouldn't he? Okay. He's um, got, he's I saw him like, at the great, like ten billion reasons. To do he was that. at the he's at the Greylock uh-huh. event with Reed Hoffman. So you, uh, you know they're gonna they're gonna really rock. They're gonna you, rock the rock the house with uh, their their cloud show. Did you? Oh, I I Amazon's gonna do really. What people don't understand about you know, look at first of all, I totally agree. Amazon's playing catch up here. They got caught flat footed, but everybody got caught flat footed. But Amazon is always used to being the horse on the on the lead. You know, and they like to be out front. They like to have the most features. They like to have people following them, right? And so, because they're closer to the customers, right? They're obsessed with the customer. But in this case, you know, somebody created something. It was like the iPhone moment. It's like, oh, shit, (laughs) let's go. But people forget that Amazon's always had a strong AI play, ML play with SageMaker. And they've got the, the, the silicon chops. And they're ahead in silicon. Now, you know, people can argue they're catching up, but it's hard to catch up in silicon. So I think they're, I think they're going to do very, very well in generative AI. This, I think, all the all three cloud players are going to do well in generative AI. We're seeing you definitely see Anthropic popping up in the spending momentum. Like I mentioned, I mentioned IBM. I'm really curious to see, you know, if they'll keep moving up. One quarter does not make a trend. And Oracle, actually, Oracle, there's interest in Oracle. So because they've got, you know, they've got some AI chops. People forget 
But the cloud yeah. guys are well, well ahead because they have the tooling. But to your other point, it's going to be a lot of stuff done on private AI on-prem about, I would estimate that a little over half of the Llama 2 downloads are going you know, on on-prem experimentation, let's say, uh, based on my sources. And I got to ask you, did you get my questions for for Adam? No, I, I did sent not. You a bunch of questions. No, I did not. Damn, you didn't I get did those? Not. No, I didn't. No, I sent was... some killer questions. You asked for like you know our input. You I gotta know. you gotta I... find those. <laughs> I just got off a plane like at midnight last night, so uh, I'll look at it today. Okay, make sure I... you find those because I yeah. put a lot of thought into it. I mean, it was kind of real time, but. Yeah, and I, I'll dig them out if you don't have. La them. Are you going to see Jassy? When well, last there? year, last year, last year, you had some great, great questions. So you and Rob Hof and Paul Gillen um, and uh, Mark Albison really made that last year's exclusive. I used well, was, all, ha ha awesome half too. half my questions were from you, and then the other third was from Rob and the editorial team. I think that I only got three of mine in. Uh, you guys crushed it. I think you know, to me. I mean, again. I don't want to rat hole on Amazon. We talk a lot about Amazon. To me, I'm more, I'm more, I'm more excited by the open AI um, and the power law that we put out there. I'm telling you right now, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen our power law research, you have to go check it out. It's getting massive traction. Um, and we're adding more onto it, but um, that is what's happening. If you have a long tail developing, you're going to have a big torso developing. These specialized models are coming out. It's clear that in open source, um, these long context LLMs as these content when context windows open up again, very nerdy kind of in the weeds here, Dave, but the super important with these vectorizations and these retrievals vector embeds, you will now have the ability to remember, remember things that differently. You brought this up earlier about these use cases. I want to go travel to a hotel. Well, how's it going to know that you like a certain thing? Well, they might've checked your email and have to remember that. How are they going to remember that? Well, the technology isn't keyword based. It's math based. So what's happening is when you have a larger context window, like it understanding your preferences or understanding what was what's in the model, it's got to remember it, and then create yeah. create these these similarities, these these uh, uh, these 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 this, these math equations, whether it's Bayesian, with all the technology they use. The bigger the context window, the recall specifics drop. You need more tokens, and so. You know, summarizing tasks, do writing blog posts, the stuff that people see now is trivial, and that looks magical, but it kind of hits a point where it's not good, right? And then that's where the next open source challenges people are really talking about. For example, the Llama Index, okay? Um, they've been doing a lot of stuff. Um, Jerry Liu over there, he's going to come on the queue, by the way, for our um, SuperCloud 5. He's the CEO of um, Llama Index. Um, they're on GitHub. They've got a great guy. He's got benchmarks out. They were pre-testing GPT-4 uh, 128K context recalls, okay? Significant drop-off, okay? After, and so, the, so uh, on performance. So it's not as good as people think. So but, you and I were talking about before, before the podcast, is RAG or retrieval augmented generation going to be challenged? Howie Shu and I were talking on Twitter about this right after the announcement that we thought that with the OpenAI's uh, GPT-4 tur Turbo, that retrieval and rag might get impacted so as it turns out a lot of the data is proving that that's not the case it just increases the need for better retrieval augmentation because the context window is taking in more context so it's it's a whole new science here for what i call search or retrieval memory context completely different paradigm shift dave than google search or keyword search I've been I've been pimping up, as you know, the the cube AI, and I didn't realize it's now you don't have to. It's not private beta anymore. It's like kind of public beta, right? You can go to the cubeai.com and and just play with it. Um, and on the and the and so, but but because there's a lot of confusion about about rag. Same thing. People are like, oh, rag's dead now, and I'm like, oh, I don't think so. Um, and so. To well, we, we got to update the, the the cube. I just got a text from Savannah Peterson. I love the AI tool, except for this one made me giggle. What, what did people? What were people? Say, what were people saying about KubeCon in Chicago? We don't have an answer for that. <laughs> well, yeah, because it, because it, it happened just, yesterday. We, yeah, I mean, we haven't. You know, it's it's as close to real time as possible. We got to get the 
you got to get the assets in there and sync it up. Look, I am digging the AI because I kind of am squinting through those short-term oh. things we fix, but it's it got good answers, Dave. Well, wait, I'm telling you, I think it's it's so ask it, ask it what Rob Thomas thinks about AI and IA, and it'll be the 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 answer will be off the charts. Ask it about Cisco's strategy what's cisco's ai strategy what's dell's ai strategy I mean, that's awesome and the, the the point i'm making is we we found um it's not so much the hallucinations that's not our problem uh, the 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 it, the issue for us is gaps in the data in yeah. other words you know like when dave donatelli came in with riverbed we you know we said all right what's riverbeds you know known for and it was like really outdated because there's not updated data in there so you got to get the updated data in there and we're not we're not crawling the web we have our own corpus and then i just wanted to make a comment on the power law the power law the by the the post that we did last week was was really well received and then this guy this data engineer he's a python developer came into my linkedin and said interesting interesting data not the best visualization so he's he busted my chops on my my shitty powerpoint skills so i gotta work on that <laughs> yeah tell, tell them we're having a hackathon come on in yeah come on top, in. We'll open top, source that graphic top and, top prize is five thousand dollars let's go yeah. you know hey, make it pretty. <laughs> well i'm working then, on i'm working on a cube graphic too it's funny i've been using um dolly to get images it's pretty amazing um on a cube um research kind of presentation of scoring companies by their relevance uh because you and i were talking about that the other day and i'm like working on this algorithm to test because everyone asks me, you know, why back up why you think IBM is not strong? And I have a reason. I'm going to have, I'm going to report on that. And I'm, when I say not strong, I mean like not the leader. Um, and maybe it's because they haven't gotten the word out, but um, I, I got to get more up to date when you and I should circle back on that. But well, the cloud guys are leading. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, Microsoft and OpenAI are leading. No question. Google is number two in my opinion amazon is 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 i think number three just because of its sage maker chops and it's what it's got with what it just went ga with and i think amazon's gonna i don't know if it's gonna overtake microsoft and and open ai oh. that's gonna take some work but i think it's gonna be it's gonna be a really good tailwind yeah. for their business and so all, all i'm saying I, IBM, I, I just don't I, think I, I don't think their innovation is have, it wait, was wait, gonna... wait 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 but ibm's not uh, they're not they're not there with these guys but they have, they have the technical foundation, and they have differentiation. I, I get it. I get it. I just, and a stack. I just, I just hold have on, a different on. opinion. They a, and they get a stack, and because of Red Hat, they have a hybrid story. It's really about AI and and hybrid yeah. cloud yeah. for them. And so now, they have to prove it and get the word out. I mean, they're not. They don't have the momentum of the cloud guys. Don't get me wrong. Okay. And but. And but it seems to me the other big takeaway was no longer is the consulting tail wagging the dog. They are getting back to their product roots. I'm and it's been a long time since what I've been dominating. What, what, what products are dominating? No, they're they're not dominating. I wouldn't say they're dominating. They haven't dominated since mainframes and and, and the ThinkPad. Right. So so I have, I have wait, I, wait, wait, I, wait 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 let me just <laughs> okay. well then say mainframes something. and ThinkPad then, then okay. say something. Okay, yeah. I think. I mean, I don't want to get too far over our skis on quantum because quantum is like this this crapshoot. Um, but if quantum actually becomes real, IBM is going to be in a good position. Uh, but it's going to take a, probably a decade for them to to show that. And I, but I think their AI, I, I don't think they're going to lead. I don't think they're going to lead like be number one in AI. I don't think I don't think that's going to happen. I think the cloud guys will. But I think IBM is going to do very very well with Arvin's achievable strategy of hybrid cloud and AI to well, and consulting yeah. to drive a lot of industry specific so the power law yeah. and IBM's going to going to throw off a lot of cash doing well, that. Well, I'm looking forward I'm looking forward to the products that actually will sell in in an innovative way versus waiting for quantum. But my my perspective is simple. Disruption factor, how is the company disrupting the current market? It seems like a me too. Adoption rate, you mentioned some momentum. How is it a me too? How is it a me too? We, they've oh. got a full stack of AI. They've announced. They announced in May. They announced in July. Watson a, 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 a Watson X for AI. Watson X for data. They got a governance module coming out. They got yeah. silicon. How is okay. that a me too? 
Well, it's their AI story. Everyone's got their AI story. The question is, how does that disrupt the, does that technology disrupt the current market? Yes or no? Does that uh, technology disrupt the current market? Yes or no? I think. I mean, I, I have a, I have a high I, bar. I, I think. I mean, IBM, maybe, I mean, I, I have think, a different bar than you do. I, I but think I, IBM, I'm, I'm not seeing anything from the charts other than re recycling their existing AI story. So maybe, oh my God, no, not at all, not at all. Well, they, well, well, I'll get the, it's, I'll get the it's data. Truly, it's truly. Well, I look at it. The, I'm just, again, but, but, but wait, but, I, but, I, look at Dave, but, Dave, but, Dave. But, stop. I'm not, I'm not litigating IBM. You don't need to answer for IBM. No, but to your question, I'm not. But to your question about is it disrupting? I don't think that's the metric. Is it disrupting the market? I don't think IBM is going to. They're not okay. the disruptor. They're the incumbent. They're going to sell to their existing client base. They're okay. going to sell to mainframe customers. They're not going to. Open AI is disrupting the market. Microsoft pulled a massive judo move and is disrupting the market. Is 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 Amazon AI disrupting the market? I mean, I, I, I mean, so. if IBM doesn't really think they want to be disrupted in the market so their customers can get the benefit of their technology, then then I don't think they got the right talent in there. But that's you think, a, is I, is Amazon disrupting the market in AI? Not yet. So is they would, Google? Google is Google. I think has disruption that going on. I would give them more disruption score than than maybe the, I again, don't understand again, what okay, disruption okay, so, means. What okay, does disruption so, mean? So when I put together my does innovation, disruption mean you're following OpenAI and Microsoft? No, a disruptive enabler. You come in with something that's new, not that's going to change and create value, enable value proposition. So, so Dave, I'm talking about something of scoring a company. So I look at a company and say, are they disruptive? Do they have a disruptive factor? Okay, some have more progressive disruption messaging or position than others do. Some take a different approach. Some take different approaches. You know this. You're an analyst, right? So it's like you know, preach to the choir. And then you say, okay, their product, does it have that disrupting enablement capability in markets like today, not quantum future market today, the AI market, customers want what they're expecting to see. User interface changes, using data, creating business value. Okay, that is the market today. That's Game. not disruption. That's business no. value. Business value disruption doesn't equal business value. Of course it does. Right? You, say, you change old. You make the old better. Or no, but you the take definition some... of business value is: Are you driving you know economic value for your customer? It's yeah. not. And, it's so, not, it's and, like, and software does that, Dave. Software but does you're that. You're saying disruption is a litmus test to value. It's one of one of them. Yes, it is. Are you okay? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Can you have? Can you create value <laughs> and not be a disruptor? Depends what the market is, Dave. So I, because I think Cisco, because that's the other thing. I was at Cisco it's last a, week. I think Cisco has got a great business, but I don't think Cisco is a disruptor. But Cisco's got an awesome business, and well, they're going to deliver value. If, for if, you're, if you're in a mature market that has no need for disruption, because it's say a steady state, then you have different um, dynamics and how you manage that market. The growth rates are different. The expectations are different. The, how you manage that market is different. That's kind of how it works. Right. Yeah, but in, every market's going to get in, disrupted in, by in, AI. In, in growing markets where there's a shift happening, the, the, there's value changes, new entrants come in, there's opportunities, things change. For example, you might have, uh, you mentioned travel. Maybe there's a travel data model that comes out from AI that creates some disruptive, positive enablement that creates more value, that creates an opportunity to create, sell another product, a net new product. That's a disruptive enabler. That's a disruption factor. Okay, that's like having the right product at the right time in a, in a growing TAM market. Adoption, do they have a product that gets adopted? What's their ecosystem look like? If they have partner channels, they got to go direct, indirect, investment in R&D, how well are they doing? I call that the innovation score. I like these scoring. Okay. I like your scoring yeah, yeah, framework. Okay, I'm just, I'm just I, saying, I, know, I like it. It's you good. can apply it. Into, it, it, it's is good. Kind of, it is kind of a score. So you say, yeah, but, okay, <clears throat> uh, Amazon, you go back to 2015, they would be check all the boxes. Yeah, but all I'm saying is that the the to me the question no question but the 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 real issue for the incumbents is can they take advantage of the disruption? Can they move fast enough to, yes, to they take don't have they don't have to invent. You're, you're, I think you might be thinking that you have to invent disruption. You can. I thought you were it. saying that they're not the disruptor. No. And I'm like, I agree with you. IBM is no. not the disruptor. Cisco is no. not the disruptor. Dell is not the disruptor. Well, I mean, they. The, the, a disruption factor for Dell or um, Cisco would be but when we talk to J2 and and Jonathan Davidson, the stuff they're doing with the data, that's disruptive for Cisco. Now, is it going to be like off the charts in terms of like a hot startup? No, but for Cisco, that takes something that's in their uh, proprietary or asset base and refactored with AI to leverage that data to provide value to their customers. It could be about documentation. Is it sexy and moving the needle? Yes, sexy. Not sexy, maybe, but moves the needle for value. That's just that, that's just value creation. So, is, I mean, can, can, is a is is Gen AI um, 
can can Gen AI be evolutionary for some companies? Yes. And I would say yes. Yes, yes absolutely. Like SaaS companies are going to apply Gen AI, and that's going to evolve their platforms. But it's not – I don't it's, see that necessarily as a dis- – Gen AI is a disruptor. Yeah, but but companies like Snowflake are going to take advantage of the disruption because they're going to b- bring bring AI into to their data. Yeah. They're not yeah. the disruptor in Gen AI. Does that make sense? Do you yeah. buy that? I it's it's it's, it's two things are having since I do buy it, but there's there's nuance. You can have a disruptive market market like with AI that's disruptive and radically revolutionary. I would say that that's what's happening. I'd consider it a revolutionary market. Sure, I agree. Okay, we agree. So, so, so that's now the impact of that revolution is the evolution in markets. So let's just take an incumbent, like take Dell or Cisco. They're in mature markets. They have install bases. They're the incumbents in some markets, but it doesn't mean they can't be innovative. That's what I'm saying. I think AI is going to make those guys more nimble. Actually, mm-hmm. it's the guys in the middle who are going to get screwed because they're stuck with they don't move as fast as to say the startups and the younger companies who are going to get instant power with AI. So you're going to have the the rich get richer and be faster so they can leverage their base of their core asset and then get net new capabilities They're going to get richer. The startups going to instantly get value and small business will get more value with AI. And then they'll take territory from the mid range company. So if you're stuck in the mid as a mid sized company, you're trying to get territory to compete with the big guys. Now you got people nipping at your heels, but you have the, the, install base incumbent factor of having an existing business and inertia you it's hard to move super fast when you're in the middle as a mid-range okay. company and so and so so yeah. that, that they, if they don't good. move fast with ai they're not going to get it so i think the big guys get get bigger uh, and the little guys get faster use the speed to take territory from the mid-range then the middle gets screwed Okay, that's my, that's my prediction. Was, was, and we'll look. We'll look back in ten okay. years, and we'll say, "Yep, that's the pod. You got Ooh, it right. Well, you got it right again." <laughs> <laughs> this is good. You and I argue, and then, uh, and then another know. analyst will say they invented it. So I coined no, that term good, five years ago. You uh, and I argue about this stuff, and then we kind of come to a conclusion. So the, the, let me just play on this for a bit. Who is the disruptor in generative AI? Open AI. Name the sure. name the company. Open, open AI. AI. Open AI. I, I would say open, I, I, AI open, open AI. Um, and, and yeah, Microsoft. Um, if you can literally go down your power, the power wait, wait, law. Wait, wait, wait. Open AI and Microsoft. Oh, we agree. No, correct. Not Microsoft's not the disruptor. They're the, they're the financer. They're the ones who, fu- who are funding. Yeah, okay, but they're partners. They're yeah, they partner. Yeah. Okay. They're like they, they're they're like the guys who have the own own the infrastructure. They're not Nvidia, the disruptors. Is Nvidia a disruptor? I think I think Nvidia is enabling that disruption. I think Anthropic, yeah. Cohere, those are all DNA, DNA from the whole Google paper and and OpenAI, they're all ex OpenAI people. Okay. Open source, open source the llama, Meta is a disruptor through by contributing all that code and then okay. the series of small specialty models are are disrupting. Uh, and then the entrepreneurs who are actually cranking, this is why the KubeCon story is relevant because that those guys are creating the smaller language models. They're the ones doing the testing. The, all the retrieval stuff is is disruptive. Um, the vector database has been around for a long time, but that as a as a ingredient in this play is disruptive. So it's the, a lot of combination of things coming together. I would say that you can even say Amazon's uh, infrastructure as a uh, scalable set of hardware is disruptive okay so, was aws so, was aws the disruptor for cloud yes right well, I mean, they, they 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 softened the ground microsoft created a vehicle funding open yeah, but, AI. They, but but they created aws created the disruption in cloud right yes, i mean cloud absolutely. was a disruptor was yes. netscape a disruptor yes they, well they're okay. creator yeah they moved okay. the needle they created the trend exactly was digital equipment corporation which nobody on this yes. podcast has ever heard of were they a disruptor yes, yes so my, of course my point is just the the disruptor in and of itself, disruption in and of itself does not necessarily equate to business value and success and economic. Of course, value. yeah, that's uh, why a company. That, that's why in my innovative score, Dave, ecosystem growth, adoption rate, does it convert? Netscape couldn't convert. Give me the Microsoft, rubric. Give me the rubric again. Disruption. Give me the rubric. Well, what are the factors? Okay, there's many factors. The innovation score that I'm putting together is about looking at a couple like IBM and others who are putting out good stuff and would, you don't know what's real, right? So I have my own little formula. Is it disruptive force? Does it have a factor? Um, how much is it factoring into the current market? Will their stuff um, blend in and ride the wave or be part of the disruption? They can play either way. Some companies will ride that disruption wave. Some will participate and, or do both. 
Number two, adoption rate of like the technology. What was it, is the market accepting it? Yes or no. Um, evaluation by the ultimate customer would be, do they develop um, a ecosystem around that partner network, customers? Sometimes it's partners in direct and direct selling relationships and integration or it's customer um, features or customer action. And then are they continuing to improve in the R&D of that? Okay. And then, you know, little things like, you know, are they build a new stuff. How do they have patented technology? Do they have a moat? Um, is there, is there longevity to it? Is it sustainable? Is it durable? Those are the kind of the high level. And then there's like a couple of other things in there that are proprietary that I look, I won't, I don't want to, I don't want to reveal. So the, mo so the moat might be like a cost advantage, for example. Yeah. Yeah, uh, library of patent. Market I mean, IBM's got the patent library. I mean, I guarantee you they probably have a huge patent library on this stuff. So that would factor in because now they can sustain and protect it and develop around it and use that asset to be a force for good in the marketplace from a disruption and innovation standpoint. So innovation is what does that do? Do they have that? Do they have the X factor? In this case, it's Watson X, pun, pun intended. Um, and looks like it's going to ride the current market. I just got to um, about what's the adoption rate look like to your point? I have some um, I have some non non NDA slides I can share with you and I yeah. want you to take a look at them. And it, then, I was really and then you look okay, at them and then other index other things I'm looking at is like okay how how is it how is it really changing the customer game? Are there metrics? Are there transformation examples? To what degree are, are is it compatible with the picks and shovels coming in the market? Okay, does IBM align with open source? Okay, that's a good question. I have no idea. I would have asked that question. If I was at the analyst meeting, I would have said, uh, does how Red you Hat align with open source? I mean, what do you mean? Yeah, of course. No idea? Well, of course. IBM owns Red Hat 100% yeah. outright. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And they're doing so, a lot of AI to make their OpenShift product more protected. It's funny. I'm sitting here, <laughs> I'm sitting here like, I know, right? I'm sitting here like defending IBM. I mean, I've been such a critic, you know, watching IBM just destroy the CEO after CEO destroying company value for for decades yeah. but i i'm telling you john i think arvin's got it right he's just simplified everything and yeah. he's brought this yeah. he's he's got a nadella like mentality yeah you know i i, I think i think that their big play is to be the operating system for the internet and and i told that to the red hat guys and i already saw they wouldn't say anything on the cube because they were got their they're all on a tight lip because it's confidential but I was kind of squinting through some of the answers and it's pretty obvious what they're excited about with edge and all this new use cases is that, you know, multi-cloud and super cloud and distributed computing is basically needs to run on something. And if you look at what they're doing with OpenShift and, and in KubeCon community backstage, for instance, which is an open source project uh, contributed by Spotify, it's kick ass. All right. And, and if Red Hat can be that, you know, put everything into the Red Hat fold, trusted, runtime environment for the internet for the, the cloud computing then the, the clients could get some great ai to be a single pane of glass why not have a chat gp a gpt that's like your it department okay automate the knobs and you know make sure that i'm that i'm standing up data pipelines and all the analytics and all my uh, there's no zero day threats protect my llms um, that's all platform engineering work that's going on. And so there's a significant shift happening in, in the marketplace, radical right now, on this piece. It's huge. Uh, there's a security paradigm shift, right? Open SSF, okay, on the threat detection. I mean, there's a lot of data protection products out there, but not a lot on the threat side, Dave. So you got the Kubernetes conundrum, the generative AI dominance, um, wearables, ethics, you know, future of work, DDoS attacks. I don't know if you noticed this, but OpenAI was down this week because of massive DDoS attacks. I know. Okay? I was trying to so, get on and I was like, what's going on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what use cases do end to end stack management? I mean, there's like a serious tech shift happening right now. And a lot of companies like IBM could have great messaging, but if they're on the wrong side of the adoption and the, and the metrics for customers uh, implementing, the new architectures for the future, they could have just a great story. Um, and I think, but I do like Ar Arvin's got the right thing about um, hybrid and edge. Um, that's not yeah. cloud. That's not cloud focused. That's not Amazon. No, but that's not but it's, Azure. It's, 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 it's future focused. Here's here's the thing. Broadly, I don't know, probably talking too much about IBM, but I will say this: when Lou Gerstner decided to buy PwC and integrate IBM instead of splitting it up into different product divisions. 
he made a he made a decision which saved IBM, but it turned IBM into a services company. They are a services company first, uh, and they used to be a product company. And um, Palmasano continued that legacy, and Ginny continued that legacy further. And Arvin is getting back, in my opinion, to IBM's product roots, and that yeah. to me is exciting. And I think it's important for the United States to have an IBM that is a that does core research, like real research, not just incremental product development, but core research that invents shit. That to me is really, really important because it's it's like, yeah. look at Xerox Park, you know, where's that? Uh, yeah. Bell Labs, Nokia owns Bell Labs, so there's those types of core research organizations are few and far between and they're american gems and uh yeah. you know I, i'm i'm hopeful just like i'm hopeful that yeah. intel will will not go bankrupt <laughs> well um well dave a lot a lot of good conversations there and again i think that we should have more of these conversations around what you we think success looks like um because i'm telling you this gen of ai thing we're going to have a huge challenge in this world to, to figure out what's real and what's not I um, like your I, innovation I, score, John. I, I like what you're, where you're going with this. Um, well, you're going to love the cube I'm putting it into. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because when you simp want to simplify it, basically, you know, imagine having a cube format, Dave, where they double click on an interactive, uh, you know, pop up cube and says, oh, three dimensional format of ranking companies, uh, three vectors intersect. So I'm playing with the idea of using the cube data um, to just have a fun way to kind of keep track of the, our aggregation and our AI um, to give a visual representation of making sense of things like that are highly nuanced, but important because there's a lot of quality problems out there today, Dave. I mean, I'm seeing, I'm seeing people get on TV and saying things that are completely wrong about these companies and they're analysts. And they just don't know what they're talking about. And 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 a lot of other analysts are saying, this is bad. And so there's a, there is an influencer culture coming around where, you know, you can be all fun and throw some haymakers around. We do that all the time just to kind of have fun. But when you're in a service business and you're an influencer or you're an analyst and you represent something that's actually not true, that's not cool. Um, and... That's what you're going to see a lot of that with deep fakes. You're going to see a lot of that with hot takes. You're going to see people re-parroting back. You got a headwind, tailwind, top line growth. Um, that's not analysis, right? So yeah. I think, well, you know, if we, you know, we have a huge data network, we're going to bring that together. And, um, you know, I mean, I mean, what do companies my, care? What do companies care about, Dave? What my, do CEOs my, care about? I'll answer that. My frustration with like the financial news in particular is, they just blow with the wind, right? Oh, the market's down. Also, oh, tech is bad. Oh, the market's up. Tech, well, it's great. Tech is great. It's going to save the world. I love Snowflake at 280. Oh, geez, I hate Snowflake at 140. I mean, it just, it changes with the wind. So what CEOs care about is building long-term value. They don't, I mean, if a CEO is worried about his or her day-to-day -day stock price, my opinion, they shouldn't be CEO. Um, what they should worry about is how, their job is to deliver shareholder value, to expand their TAM, and, to, and the way they do that is to make sure they're delivering customer value. They've got strong engineering. They've got great go-to-market, and their, their strategy allows them to build a platform that can get them into new markets. But it's all about the long-term value, um, unless, you know, you want to get sold, you know, clean it up and flip it, you know, do a pump and dump. But the best CEOs that I've observed over time, um, like the Larry Ellison's, the Michael Dell's, um, I think I think I think Jassy's in it for the long term. <laughs> Nadella, Nadella doesn't care about his stock price, you know, day to day. I mean, that's just absurd. Why would he? You think Warren Buffett cares about his stock price? What is what it's doing today? He probably doesn't even look. Yeah. Uh, but he probably does look, but doesn't lose sleep over it, I guarantee. So that's what it's all about. And I think yeah. that's, you know, the best analysts, the Wall's best analysts, Wall Street analysts and industry analysts are fundamental well, uh, thinkers. Dave, you've been, we, you know, you've been an analyst from, you know, in the industry, you know, the modern era, we're building that out. And most, most people will look at the changes we're going through in this new environment where organic and community matter 
um, especially with open source and open source um, content and like we what we do. What it what is your vision for the cube research and for the folks watching we you know we are rebranding wikibon as the cube research team um and we'll have a site for that we're going to you know continue to do more and publish more of our research make things continue to make things as fast as possible you'll see a lot more videos just a lot more ai hitting the screen i'm loving the cube ai both on the cubes video ingestion as well as the the, the knowledge graphs we got uh, an expert network eighteen thousand people thirty five thousand videos um dave what is the cube research vision um, I mean, as a modern era, as the world changes, um, yeah. So customers need more, need new service, they need a new kind of service. Is the game the same? Does it remain the same? Does it change? What's your vision? Well, well, I mean, you know, I mean, we're all about you know changing, John. And speaking of disruption, that's us. We have had a front row seat for over a decade with the Cube on high quality content, how high quality content is created distributed, consumed by audiences, what audiences care about, and how they get value out of content. And so the Cube research is all about contributing to the silicon angle and Cube vision of the Cube global and our global community and bringing a knowledge base that is fact-based, that's data-based, that can back up our opinions and serve both our audience, which is practitioners and elite business technology people, and can serve our customers, our clients, who really want to get their story in front of that audience with content that matters. And that's yeah. really yeah. what the Cube Research is all about. I'll also share a quick story for you, a little bit of a um, prop, but I'm just gonna, I was at in Chicago. Um, a public company CEO came up to me and said, you know, the partnership with the Cube and Silicon Angle and Wikibon, now the Cube Research Advisory, um, has been a game changer for us. The, the, the partnership approach, partnering um, has been was a key point there. And then I ran into a um, head of analyst relations for another company, and, and she said that you guys go beyond just helping craft um, you know, the stories and positioning and forecast, but you guys help us build the future, okay? You guys don't even have a retainer where you guys should do that immediately um you guys help our stakeholders and then and then finally the cmo said you guys help us lead the competition with the content the next seeing the trends and helping the content strategies map to augmenting their role uh, and i think this modern content market's coming where the website's going to be just you know infrastructure you're seeing that with the videos now and the ai being like the the co-pilot um i think that's where i see the best intersection it's just having that trusted relationship with our customers and allowing us to do great content listen if you're a company and you're not completely rethinking your entire content strategy and how to reinvent ar and pr you're you're gonna be left behind i mean yeah. how you're using real-time data obviously ai um, and, 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 and in the moment knowledge, like it's a speed game, yeah. but it's also a quality game. And the other thing too, John is community. I was thrilled at the IBM facility. So, uh, myself, Sanjeev Mohan, uh, Tony bear and Merv Adrian did a collaboration because that's, we're very collaborative. We're collaborative with other analysts. You know, we're not the only analyst firm in the world right i mean there's obviously gartner idc if they if any analyst does good work i want to learn from it because i have i have great respect for for other analysts that, that ibm this week man there were some smart people they were like david floyer class people yeah yeah going deep and i'm like wow that that individual is smart i want to learn from her or i want to yeah. learn from him and and they are welcome in yeah. our community and we'd love to amplify their research. We've worked with every type of analyst firm yeah. out there from Gartner, IDC, Forrester, ESG, you know, you name it. We've opened our, 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 our arms to have I'll, people. On I'll tell you, I've platform. been doing, I've been doing a lot of talking to heads of heads of comms and heads of ARs and top CMOs. And what's happened has been some big blowback lately and on, on a couple of examples. And this is going to be a first generation problem as as you get more content into the analyst game where it's organic, 
traditionally an earned media play, organic content, like what we're doing and some of the services we do as a trusted partner, for example. Credibility is everything. And once someone does something in the community that's not good for the reputation, the client gets the blowback. So you're starting to see this on Instagram, Dave, where these um, influencers will say whatever it takes to get the product sold. And what's happening is CMOs and, and executives saying reputation risk is out there. So what's going to happen in B2B is you want to judge, uh, be judged by the company that you keep. And, and the analysts that you choose, if they're out there throwing um, fake information around and not having the depth, that's on you. So I think you're going to see a couple of blowbacks come back on that. Reputation is everything. And having substance will matter. And, you know, the one thing of doing the cube for 13 years is, you know, <laughs> we've seen the movie a few times and, you know, we, we've had the long game approach of just hanging out with great people, talking to smart people and getting the trends right and being a great service. And, and so a little bit of a rant here on, on the market of how it's changing um, CMOs, head of comms, head of analyst relations. This is the new marketing formula for the companies because everyone is now seeing everything. So you can't hide behind fake news, fake analysis, fake influence. You got to show it on a consistent basis, and and that's going to be the that's going to be the new filter, Dave. I think you're going to see that. So. Um, I'm excited to see what 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 future can bring with the cube research and building that bridge to the future. Well, and I want to shout out to uh, our colleagues at ETR. <clears throat> I've had a, a multi-year, well over three years now, partnership with ETR. You know, predates the pandemic, um, and the more I get to know them, the more uh, high-quality people who do amazing data work. They're not just they're not just a survey house, right? I mean, these guys they, they truly are data analysts. Uh, they've got real data scientists, um, and they're just yeah, yeah. high quality people of, of, of impeccable ethics. I saw to Ray Wong, and I saw to Sanjeev, even though a bunch of great analysts out there. You know what the common theme is? When I talk to folks, it's a service business, and he's probably a good service. Ray and, Wong, man, he yeah, was at you know. he was at IBM, <laughs> and, and he was at, at at Dell. He's so good. I mean, at dinner last night. You know, he, you know how good he is on the cube. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he, Ray is just the guy's so knowledgeable about what, you know, geo, what's going on in the world, uh, what's going on in tech. And he's just super articulate. I, I really like him a lot. Well, our rant section turned out to be a rant on the media itself, Dave, and the analyst yeah. relations PR CMO equation. I am super excited that the, the media business is going to shift in house to these companies. They're going to have they're going to have needs and service, and uh, I think we can help them out there. Uh, we got big events coming up. I'll be at Supercomputing next week. Uh, we got coverage of uh, Microsoft Ignite. We also have reInvent coming up. We're going to have a Super Cloud Five special edition in studio in Palo Alto. Um, we're going to have the Llama Index CEO, a bunch of a, um, top. Um, AI folks in the Valley coming into Palo Alto. We'll have a live stream for two days. Lisa Martin, Savannah Peterson will be hosting in studio. You and I will be in, in Vegas for AWS's annual conference. Uh, we're going to talk to all the top people doing interviews, check out that stream. And then, uh, you know, then end of the year, they can't believe it. Well, that's going to be exciting, John. I mean, you and you and I are going to be on the ground. Um, we're just we're all, we have multi continents going on here, right? Rob and Rebecca out in in uh, Barcelona, HPE Discover. Um, yeah. yeah, Super Cloud it's, five, five AI, Super Clouds, AI, John, four Super Clouds AI, this year. AI Amazing. madness. Well, AI madness is just so much fun. I got to say, I love this market. I love what's going on. I love the disruption. I love how everybody's winning. We're gonna watch this mid range. I might not be, I might not be accurate on that, but my gut's telling me that the big winners will be the big players and the startups and small companies. So, you know, right now, that's who I see getting the most value is AI. So, this is just the beginning. You know, inference is the new web app, as uh, Tim Hawkins at Google said on stage at KubeCon. I totally love that. I think he's right on the money. I think you, this next generation of developers in open source are going to set the agenda. And you watch, you watch the big guys get dressed for the party. Okay, Dave, but you, the action is in open source. Um, and that's like where everyone's trying to read the tea leaves. So if you're not in open source and you might miss what's going on there, great benchmarks, great technology, great innovators. And then the big guys are tooling up for the picks and shovels and for the market. <laughs>
It's going to be huge. All right. Dave, All right, John. have a great cool. weekend. And that's, yeah, uh, ditto. I'll talk is, to you uh, probably tomorrow. That's a wrap for uh, 37 pod. See you next time.